the employment assessments, legalities, and landmines to avoid. My name is Julie Dore, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, with the remaining time available for your questions. If during the presentation you have questions, just feel free to type them in that designated section to the right. You can either use the chat feature or the question feature, and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Earlier this morning, I mailed you a link to the copy of the presentation we're using for today's webinar. If you haven't received it, feel free to email me right now at julie at enlightenedbiz.com. The email is also on the screen right there, julie at enlightenedbiz.com, and I'll send that to you right away. Before we get started, please note that this webinar and all of the accompanying materials are protected by copyright and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and does not constitute legal advice. And speaking of that, we won't be addressing all the different types of assessments that you might be using in your workplace. We're going to keep them more to the legalities and some of the landmines that you want to avoid today. And then we also recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address your specific situation. So let's get started today by welcoming today's expert panel. First, we have attorney Marla Mara Robinson. Marla is with the law firm Mara Robinson, Jackson, and Clarkson where she's a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices uh, law in the areas of corporate, mergers and acquisition, real estate, finance, and employment. We also have Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda works with business owners and executives to provide strategic human resources direction, develop leadership talent, and increase organizational effectiveness. So Marla's going to start us off today. So Marla, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Julie. So our first slide here is our agenda. We're going to talk specifically about the different types of assessments. Some we'll spend more time on than others because we've done a webinar on, on a few others um, with respect to the, the governing laws, which means we'll end up speaking more to the equal employment opportunity laws than the other laws, although I will point out the, the particular statutes that are specific to certain assessments. I will be using the terms test and assessment interchangeably, and we can um, discuss uh, offline or if we have time during the question and answer period that, um, whether there's a difference, um, and I'll try and point out sometimes when there is and when there isn't. We're going to discuss the problems with assessments, and Linda, as a recruiter, is going to give us some of her recommendations, what she's seen is, is it works best, and then best practices overall for testing. I read an article recently with a, a quote from an attorney named Daniel Schwartz, he's an employment attorney in Connecticut. And I'd like it to remain in, in the front of your mind as we go through the pre presentation. In speaking about um, testing, Mr. Schwartz said, are you using a test to screen out an applicant or to provide insights on people who you are interested in? These are two different reasons. So our next slide is the first type of, of employment test is cognitive test. A cognitive test assess reasoning, memory, perceptual, per perceptual speed, and accuracy. We assess skills in arithmetic and reading comprehension. I think everyone remembers those from grade school. Grade school. And they assess knowledge of a particular function or job. These tests are also known as aptitude tests um, or general intelligence assessments. And as I go through these different types of tests, you'll see there is some crossover. So the next type of tests are, are physical ability tests. They measure the physical ability to perform a task. They might. It might be the strength of specific muscle groups, legs, back, arms, or strength and stamina in general. The next type of test would be a sample job test. Performance test, the best example I can give with performance test is typing test. In any law firm, we used to give typing test to every person who walked in the, in the door. Not so much anymore because we have a lot of dictation software. But that's an example of a good performance test. Simulations of the actual work going to be done, work samples, realistic job previews. For example, in a manufacturing line, we might have someone who needs to be able to work with very small detailed items of a particular product. We might give them those items to see if they have the ambidextrity to put those in. And these tests assess performance and aptitude on specific and particular tasks. The next type of, of tests are medical exams which can include psychological tests, physical exams, mental health exams, and then drug tests. And 
you will see as we get into the discussion um, regarding the legal landmines, this area has lots of them. We've done a, 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 a webinar before on drug tests. All of these come with some legal risk, some higher than others. And because we've discussed drug tests um, before, we won't spend as much time on that as we will on the other medical exam. Next type is personality tests and integrity te tests. Their aim is to assess the degree to which a person has certain traits, like dependability, cooperativeness, safety orientation, or to predict the likelihood that the person will engage in, in certain conduct. This person is likely to engage in theft or absenteeism. Now, as a reminder here, and you'll hear throughout, no test is without error and no test is perfect, which would lead, can lead to a discussion later about whether you should test at all. The next type of test that most everyone is familiar with are criminal background checks, which would provide information on arrest and, and conviction history. Credit checks, you know, which provide information on credit financial history. We've also done a webinar on these two recently, so I won't cover much here. But I would just want to point out, because it came up yesterday and again today with clients of mine, um, that these types of tests are one of the reasons why uh, pre-employment testing has become more um, acceptable to employers. There are employers who are, are being sued daily for negligent hiring. When you have somebody in a job where it's important to know their background because they're dealing in people's homes, for example, they're coming into the home and, and cleaning the home, or they're dealing with children, or they're dealing with the elderly. We want to know if that person has a criminal background, um, especially if it's you know a sexual background or tied to that specific you know, to children or to the elderly. So employers are, these types of tests are becoming more and more favored um, by employers. The landmines here are both with federal and state law, and, and that's with the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act and the uh, California Investigative Consumer Reporting Agencies Act, which have very specific limited circumstances when you can do these types of checks and the types of notices that you need to give and disclaimers that we've covered in, in prior webinars. If anybody needs that, we can forward it on to them. And I would add to this polygraph tests, which are prohibited under both federal and state law with limited exceptions for, for um, investigating theft. The next type of, of test is English proficiency test to determine English fluency. And I'm sure most of you are aware that the equal employment opportunity laws prohibit this unless it's for a business necessity. But as always, California is more restrictive. You can't have an English-only policy in California unless it's required to do the job and is related to job safety. And there's no other reasonable alternative. So it's very restrictive. So what, what, why would it matter if we were testing, for example, for English fluency? What would be one of our risks? Um, uh, or one of our la la legal landmines. The first that we're going to discuss is the governing equal employment opportunity laws. And the first one of those laws is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This applies to employers of 15 or more employees. Title VII says it prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It prohibits both disparate treatment and disparate impact. It allows employers to test as long as they're not designed, intended, or used to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The act also imposes restrictions on how to score tests. Employers are not permitted to adjust the scores or use different cutoff scores or otherwise alter the results of employment-related tests on the basis of those same protected areas, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It, Title VII prohibits both intentional discrimination and disparate um, impact discrimination. One is called disparate treatment and the other is disparate impact. Disparate treatment discrimination is, is when an employer intentionally tests to eliminate people of a certain race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And when I say eliminate, remember that in this testing and assessment area we're not just talking about application for employment, but think always of hire, fire, promote, demote. Uh, any, any employment condition as well as for benefits. So disparate treatment is the intentional discrimination based on those protected classes. It, Title VII also prohibits tests or selection procedures that have the effect of disproportionately excluding persons, 
uh, persons based on those um, protected classes, and that's called disparate impact. So while the employer may not have intended to exclude or um, assess differently based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, the test itself has that as, as an outcome. Disparate impact cases typically involve the following issues. Does the employer use a particular employment practice that has an, a disparate impact on the basis of rec, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin? For example, it requires all applicants pass a physical agility test. Does that um, disproportionately screen out women? We have to determine whether the test or the selection procedure has a disparate impact on a particular group. We do that by statistical analysis. If it does have a disparate impact, then we have to look at is it job related and consistent with business necessity? Because if it is, it may still be okay. It may have a disparate impact, but it may not be illegal because it has the job related, um, it is job related and it is consistent with business necessity. If the employer can show that the selection procedure is job related and consistent with business necessity, then we have to see if the employee can challenge it based on the fact that there's some other less discriminatory alternative available to make the screen or make the decision. And if it can, then that test is not going to be validated as well. In 1978, the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission adopted the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, or as you see on the slide, UGESP. And this is also under Title VII, so 15 employees or more. This provides uniform guidance for employers about how to determine if their test and selection procedures were lawful for purposes of Title VII disparate impact theory. Now, there, there are three, uh, the, the the UGESP outlines three different ways to validate tests. They're very complicated, very technical. You can find them online easily. Um, and, and if you are using any testing or assessments, you should review them and be familiar with them. Um, it, it, they discuss, the guidelines discuss how an employer can show tests are job related and consistent with business necessity with, with these three different test validations. And, and keep in mind, a validation study is only a way to show that a test with adverse impact is job related and, and has business necessity. If it does, then it's not discriminatory. It's, it's not a government stamp of approval that this test is okay. Validation is just that. It's validation that it's not discriminatory. And it can be used as a defense in cases where employees bring claims that you violated these equal employment opportunity laws or the other statutory laws that we addressed. Um, validation also refers to the statistical documentation or study that evidences the pre-employment assessment. It, 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 and we want to make sure that what the test or assessment is measuring is what it purports to measure. Think validity test measure is a test that measures what it is supposed to measure, and reliability is that it measures the same thing consistently. So if I test you today, then I test you again tomorrow, and it comes out the same, that's consistent. So another EEO um, law is the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act. And Title I of the ADA prohibits private employers and state and local governments from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities on the basis of their disabilities. So when hiring, an employer may not ask questions about disability or require medical exams until after a conditional job offer is made. As you know, California has similar laws to these federal laws we're talking about. It's the Fair Employment and Housing Act. It applies to employers of five employees or more. So many of these EEO federal laws are also mirrored in uh, FEHA and, um, and our potential claims under California law as well. Under the ADA, after making an offer and before the person starts working, the employer may ask disability-related questions and conduct medical exams as long as it does so for all individuals entering into the same job category. So you can't pick and choose. And the employer may also ask about disability to require a medical exam if job related and a business necessity. Now remember, it is unlawful to use a test to screen out employees with disabilities unless job related and consistent with the business necessity. And you can also have liability here if you fail to reasonably accommodate once you discover a disability, unless that accommodation would be an undue hardship. We are seeing lots and lots of litigation in this area. 
with the plaintiffs. Those of you who have listened to our other webinar, we did a little bit on the FIHA. Uh, with the plaintiffs bar, the and attorneys that represent employees, really like this area of the law because we don't have a black and white definition of what's reasonable when we're talking about accommodating someone with a disability. And clearly what's reasonable for Coca-Cola may not be reasonable for your company. And we also don't have a clear definition of what constitutes an undue hardship. Is it something that costs 1% of gross revenues, or is it no defined term of amount? It's not defined. So it, it's open to argument from both sides. The next federal law is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which prohibits discrimination based on the, um, the protected ages of 40 and above, not 41, but 40 and above, with respect to all terms and conditions of employment, including hiring, promotion, reductions of force, benefits, every condition of employment. And again, it prohibits both disparate treatment and disparate impact, as they all do. So you can intentionally discriminate by taking action against someone because of their age 40 or above, or you can unintentionally do so because it's the result of how a test or assessment um, measures. So California, again, the FIHA uh, statute mirrors this. And ADA, the federal statute is for employers of 20 or more. But again, FIHA in California, you're under the same restrictions at five or more employees. Our next um, slide, I'm going to give you some examples of some uh, cases in this area to just kind of give you an idea of some of the tests. The first one is EEOC versus Ford Motor Company and United Automobile Workers of America. And as you'll see, most of these cases come from the EEOC. Uh, we could pull very similar cases from um, the DFEH, would be the Department of Fair Employment and Housing for California specific. But we pulled some federal laws. In this case, or federal cases, in this case the court held that less discriminatory alternatives were available for cognitive cognitive tests that had a disparate impact. The case involved a court-approved settlement agreement on behalf of a nationwide class of African Americans who were rejected for an apprenticeship program. They took a cognitive test known as the Apprenticeship Training Selection System, or ATSS. It, uh, the ATSS was a written cognitive test that measured verbal, numerical, and spatial reasoning in order to evaluate mechanical aptitude. Although it had been validated in 1991, which means it went through the validation test, the three validation tests I spoke about earlier, the ATSS continued to have a statistically significant disparate impact of excluding African American applicants. Less, discri less discriminatory selection procedures were subsequently developed that would have served Ford's needs, but Ford did not modify its procedures. In this case, Ford was aware that they were out there as well. So a settlement agreement was reached with the EEOC and Ford, and Ford agreed to replace the, the ATSS with a different selection procedure to be designed by jointly selected industrial psychologists, which you um, should know are very heavily involved in a lot of these workplace assessments, that would predict job success and then reduce, reduce the adverse impact. Additionally, the interesting part, Ford paid $8.55 million in monetary relief. So these um, legal landmines are not inexpensive. <laughs> Uh, an example of Title VII and physical strength test was a case EEOC versus Dial Corp. In this case, the court held strength, that the strength test must be job-related and consistent with business necessity if it disproportionately excluded women. So just as we were speaking about earlier. Um, here, women were uh, disproportionately rejected for entry-level production jobs because of a strength test. This test had a significant adverse impact on women. Prior to the use of the test, 46% of hires were women. After the test, only 15% of hires were women. That is a significant impact. And Dial defended the test by noting that it looked like the job and use of the test had resulted in fewer injuries to hired workers. But after investigation and through expert testimony, the EEOC established that the test was considerably more difficult than the job. So it didn't match what was required on the job. And that the reduction in injuries actually occurred two years before the test was implemented. And it was perceived to be most likely due to improved training and better job rotation procedures. So here's another example of where um, it have to, the physical exam has to relate to the job itself. So you're not going to test somebody for lifting 50 pounds if they're never going to have to lift more than 20. The next example is an ADA-related case. 
again, EEOC versus Daimler Chrysler. These are obviously all entities that you're all familiar with, companies you all know. And in this case, the court held the employer must provide reasonable accommodation on pre-employment tests for hourly unskilled manufacturing jobs. This was a case brought on behalf of applicants with learning disabilities who needed reading accommodations during a pre-employment test given for hourly unskilled manufacturing jobs. The resulting um, settlement agreement, so it didn't go to trial, provided monetary relief for 12 identified individuals and the opportunity to take the hiring test with the assistance of a reader. Uh, the agreement provided um, that the employer would provide a reasonable accommodation on this particular test to each applicant who requested a reader and provided documentation establishing an ADA disability. The accommodation consisted of either a reader for all instructions and all written parts of the test or an audio tape providing the same information. There's a, a, another recent case in this area with, with a, that a woman brought that hasn't gone to court or to settlement yet where she was um, hearing disabled. And so she's seeking the same type of accommodation. That her, she uh, failed a communication assessment. Um, the assessment came back that, 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 that she couldn't communicate well. It was because she couldn't hear. So now she wants to, the opportunity to retake the test with an accommodation, the accommodation being somebody to read for her. And on that, I am going to turn it over to Linda Duffy and have her talk about problems with assessments and testing. Thanks so much, Marla. That was great. Hi, everyone. Um, Marla's been talking about some of the legal issues with regard to tests. And I'm going to tell you all up front, my personal bias is to not use a lot of assessments, and I'll tell you why. But I am also going to give you some examples of where we have used assessments during um, the recruiting process. Once somebody's on board and you want to give them an assessment <clears throat> for different reasons, like team building and things like that, perfectly great. Um, but some of the problems that I find with assessments is that you know, traits and characteristics you know, change over time. So all you're getting when you give them an assessment pre-employment, you're getting a snapshot of how they are in that moment. It doesn't really tell you um, how they're going to change over time. It certainly doesn't take into account cultural fit unless the assessment's been designed specifically for your culture. Um, studies have shown that correlations between personality tests and job performance are not actually that strong. In fact, um, there was a 2007 review of academic literature published in Personnel Psychology that found the correlations between personality and job success fall in the 0.03 to 0.15 range, which the authors characterized as, quote unquote, close to zero. Now, you'll find other studies that make, a, make an argument that you know, they can be useful. I'm just going to tell you, my personal bias up front as we go through this is I lean on the side of don't use them for some of these reasons we're going to talk about. Um, many of the studies, many of the assessments rather in the tests that have been used were developed for academic use. They're testing a theory. They're not testing how this shows up in business on a daily basis. So they can't show you any tie to actual business results. I'm all about making sure you're going to get the actual business results, and so that's why I have a little bit of a hard time with this. Also, you have situations where candidates game the assessment, meaning you know, they may go into it trying to answer the questions in a way they think you want them answered. So let's say you're giving them an assessment and you're going to test something on them, like honesty. You know, I've taken those type of assessments before. Frankly, you'd have to be pretty darn stupid to flunk that when they ask you things like, um, you know, to agree or disagree with a statement, like, I think it's okay to take company property home without permission, things like that. So, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen an assessment that measures honesty and integrity that I like so far, but maybe some of you have, and work hard to if you want to continue using those, just keep in mind all of the uh, requirements and sort of warnings that Marla gave you. And finally, for most of my clients, you know, clients use it as a clutch. They don't feel confident in their hiring. They don't believe that they are good interviewers or good recruiters, and so consequently, they're looking for, you know, the silver bullet. They're looking for some sort of magical solutions that, that's going to tell them that this person's going to be good at a job. And I just don't believe that such a test exists. Now, here are some results on three different tests that are commonly, commonly used. Um, it's not during the recruiting process, certainly by companies um, for different purposes. So a strength finder, for example, um, published by Gallup a number of years ago, you know, here were the five that showed up for me, right? Relator, responsibility, achiever, activator, and arranger. On the disk, I typically, my results show a high 
ISD and a secondary I. And on the Kirsty Temperament Disorder, I show up as an ISTJ. The question is, what do those actually mean? You know, do those tell you anything there tell you whether I'm going to be good at a certain job or good at running a business? You know, so one of the things you have to keep in mind is, you know, how how are you going to interpret these results? Who's going to interpret the results? And you want to make sure not only do they apply to the job in question, but that somebody's actually qualified to do the interpretation. So you're not just getting a report that gets spit out, you know, of some computer or something, and then it's left to somebody, whether it's in your HR department or even worse, in like a line management situation and allowing them to make a determination about whether somebody that has, you know, an ISTJ on the QRC temperament disorder is going to be good in that particular role. Um, my personal bias, I mentioned a minute ago, is that you learn how to recruit. And what we do as a really simple thing, um, really simple outline here, is we always start when we recruit by developing what we call a success profile that has specific performance measurements tied to corporate strategic objectives. So when we sit down with a client, we'll ask them questions about where they're going to go over the course of the next year or the next two years, five years, however far out they can look. You know, is their business growing? Are they going to go into a new market? Are they going to shut down? Are they going to be having layoffs? I mean, what is it they're going to be doing? Are they going to come up with new product lines? Are they going to expand into a new geographic territory? What is their corporate outlook? Once we do that, we can run ads and we can source candidates for however we're going to, you know, find the people for them, but based on all of that. So we're really clear about what the person has to do to be successful in that role. We'll take a look at the paper, you know, resumes that come in, do a paper screen, and then we'll conduct a brief phone screen up front to sort of separate the men from the boys, if you will, to say, okay, you know, who are people that we really want to spend some more in-depth time with? And I usually recommend to my clients, you just pick three questions that will make or break a candidate and just explore, hey, you know, if I'm going to call the salesperson up, I'm going to ask them these two or three questions, and if they don't have satisfactory answers to those questions, there's really no point in meeting in person. So once you know you get through that brief phone screen, if it looks like or sounds like they you know are worth having a closer look at, then at that point we would schedule them for an in-person, much more in-depth behavioral interview. And at that point, we're going to use that success profile and we're going to develop um, scenarios to document you know on-point prior experience and ask them about um, what what they've done similarly. And we're also going to use questions to elicit a cultural fit because at the end of the day. You know, that's really what's most important for most of these clients is they find someone that's qualified, yes, but there's usually many people out there that are qualified on paper, but the bigger question is who's going to fit in their culture and be able to operate within their system. And then five, we do use assessments from time to time, and I am going to give you some examples, um, examples of how we can use those during the recruiting process and hiring process. Um, but we only use assessments at that point where we're toward the end and we've narrowed it down to the top candidate or the top two or three candidates, and at that point, we might incorporate some sort of assessment just to give us one more a final final data point. Um, you know, most hiring managers, though, again, are believe that their success in recruiting is no better than a coin toss. I'm hoping that we, if we work with them on doing this first step in particular, that it's going to change that because most of the time, when I see problems with their recruiting and their confidence in hiring somebody, they completely skip that first step about the about studying performance um, measurements. And so these were measurements I took right out of a success profile from a few years ago. We were working with a company hiring somebody as a VP of sales. And so these are very specific, as you can see, you know, with the nine months increased sales of console service by 30%. You know, that's very specific. And so you would sit down with the, with the candidate and you would ask them, you know, in the past, you know, give me an example of a time where you've increased sales of a product by 30% within nine months. How did you go about doing that? What were the challenges you had? How did you overcome those? Who did you work with? I mean, you could sit down and ask questions forever on just that one bullet point alone. So this is the most critical step from my point of view when it comes to recruiting. And if you can get this part right, this is really how you should be thinking of assessments. You don't use, you don't need any other tests so to speak, after that point if you're good at developing this and then de designing some interview questions to be able to um, weed out people that are going to be good or not good at doing this particular function. Now, 
for those of you that do want to test or want an assessment of some kind, um, I wanted to just share this with you. Um, this book, it says on here, Expected Availability 3.1. As of a couple days ago, uh, Amazon did not have it released yet, but you can pre-order it on Amazon at $189 as of a couple days ago. Or you can go to the website. If you just Google the 19th Mental Measurements Yearbook, it'll take you to the website um, from the company that actually publishes this, the Bureau's Institute of Mental Measurements. Um, they've been doing this since 1938. This is 875 pages of nothing but different tests. So it will tell you um, what types of tests. It's really designed to assist people who want to use some sort of standardized testing. Um, it will give you factual information about the test. It will tell you. Um, it'll give you critical reviews. It'll tell, talk about validity, reliability, um, anything that you want. Um, it offers evaluations in education, psychology, business, law, healthcare, counseling, and management. Um, it'll tell you where to get the test, what the price is, who offered them, everything you want to know about the test. So for those of, those of you that are really interested in using some sort of assessment, this is where you can go, sort of a one-stop shop to uh, do a little bit more investigation and find out if any of these ass assessments would be right for your organization. Again, keeping in mind all of the different things that Marla mentioned as cautions before. Now, I, I am going to tell you the ones that I use or some of my clients use right now to give you an idea of uh, some that you might want to take a look at. Uh, we subscribe, Ethos Human Capital Solutions subscribes to a testing service. We can offer over 1,800 skills-based tests when we're doing recruiting for our clients, falling into all those different categories. Um, so we take a look at the ones for the positions we're trying to fill. So for example, uh, last week I was helping an attorney hire a legal assistant. We asked the candidate, the final can two candidates, to take um, two different skills tests. One was on business writing skills, and then it was mostly, I think, um, sort of SAT, almost like grammar, you know, you know, finishing the sentences, tenses of words, and stuff like that. And then the second one was clerical proofreading. So they would give you, you know, columns and with where their mistakes. They would ask you to look at a chart or a graph and, um, you know, check it for errors. So both of those skills are super critical in that particular legal system position. There's a lot of attention to detail that goes on. The person has to be able to, to write uh, directly with clients in a business setting. And so we selected those two particular tests. So you could test people on, it's, it's amazing, out of these 1,800. I mean, if you want New Zealand accounting skills, they're there. You know, um, if, anything you can think of, basically. So if you have any questions about skills testing or want to incorporate uh, some of those tests into your recruiting process, just reach out to me. Happy to talk to you about that and happy to um, help you uh, with those assessments. Another thing that we've done in the past is use what I'll just generally refer to as homework. A lot of times this is used for at the executive level or senior manager level. And I'll give you a couple of examples. A um, number of years ago, we were hiring an EVP of worldwide sales for a high-tech company. And as we got down to the final couple of candidates, we actually asked them to spend a week or so putting together a business plan, a sales plan for us. Uh, we wanted to see not so much, you know, we didn't think hey, they're going to have something based on their limited knowledge, you know, and we're going to, you know, be able to take that and run with it when they start. But we wanted to see their way of thinking. We wanted to see how they present information, um, how they do market research, um, you know, things like that that were going to be critical in their role once they came on board. Um, I think Marla's brother even was asked to do this recently. Maybe Marla will comment on that. But to develop a marketing plan for a company. Uh, we certainly have brought people into the office sometimes at lower levels and asked them, maybe write a business letter based on a set of facts or, again, something that's related to the job itself. Um, one word of caution is, you know, and you might want to seek Marla's counsel on this, is, you know, if you're going to consider having them come in and actually do some homework or do, you know, something on the job to demonstrate their um, ability to do the job, under certain circumstances, you will need to pay them for that. Possibly not in the examples I just gave you, but um, another manufacturing company where we're placing a manufacturing manager, they said, you know, hey, we'd really like to bring them on board and have them work for a week, um, and we'll pay them, which was great, except they were both, you know, both of the candidates were currently employed, so that didn't work out too well. And in general, you would be able to do something like that. One of the tests that 
um, one of my clients uses very extensively is called the divine or divine inventory. And I still, I'm somewhat skeptical about whether or not uh, this is customized enough for culture. But I will say that I do like the divine inventory profile. Um, what it does is it gives you, uh, it targets 33 behavioral areas and competencies for the job position. And there's a lot of job positions out there. And there's a certain amount of customization that goes on. So it's not the same test for every position. So in this particular little snapshot I took, came out of a sales manager role. And then it's going to give you a rating for the overall job set. And then it's going to match the candidate to specific behaviors. So for example, the top 11 behaviors in those 33 are broken down into top, middle, and low. I just took a snapshot of the top three. So it'll give you like goal orientation, for example, assertiveness and communication. And it says in this particular candidate, um, five out of the 11 were matches. And if you look to the pretty part on the right, you'll see where the, the hash marks are, like the lines through six, seven, eight on goal orientation is where the company believes that person needs to be on goal orientation. Um, and then where the dot is, is where the candidate actually fell based on their answer to a question. So in the case of goal orientation and assertiveness, the person is right in the sweet spot of where the company wants them to be. On, on the competency for communication, however, the person is satisfactory overall, but lower than what the company believes they should be. And so that is an area where you would want to continue to work with them. You may or may not rule them out based on that, but you would want to um, ask for the questions about it. And one of the things the Divine Inventory does really well is they provide you with tailored behavioral interview questions to, pro to probe those areas for development further. So on communication as an example, where the person wasn't at the level that they would want, you get questions that are tailored to drill down further to see if you're satisfied with their answers or if, in fact, the communication skills are so low that you need to weed them out um, as a candidate. So this comes as part of the divine inventory. And I think it's a good tool overall. Again, I would never use any sort of assessment as a single decision-making point, but to give you a little bit more insight into a candidate um, when it's tailored specific to a job can be useful information. And then my personal favorite is the DISC. A lot of people know I do a lot of training around the DISC, on team building, management training, everything. Um, it provides insights into a person's behavior. So it's not personality-based as much, and it will flex and shift over time depending on the role. That's one of the reasons I actually like it. Um, there's several versions of the DISC out there. These are just some of them. There's a classic style. And then the products that I use more often than any others of the middle three there. Everything just management, everything just sales, and everything just workplace. And there's also a newer one called everything just work of leaders. Now, one thing about DISC, as with many of these assessments, it is not validated as a predictive hiring tool. But it can be used to round out teams. Let me give you a couple of examples how we've used it. Um, when I worked for an advertising agency a number of years ago, they had a seminar promotion model, meaning that's how they went to market. So we had a group of what we call national marketing directors that would go out into uh, real estate offices, deliver a scripted presentation, and upsell them tickets to an event. And then at this event, this training seminar, they would be platform sold the actual marketing materials. So we were trying to hire a new vice president of sales. Well, almost all of the national marketing directors, we had about 20 at that time, on the disc would show up as a combination of DI behavior. So if you don't know DISC, sorry, play along. But for those of you that know DI, so they're very results oriented, but they're very, um, you know, the performance part of them comes out on the I side. They're very people oriented. They're very high, you know, fast paced, outgoing people. And when we interviewed the final two candidates, there was a guy that showed up and we asked them to do the first portion of the presentation. And there's one candidate who was flawless, and he was like all about style and the performance and everything. And then the other candidate stumbled his way through the presentation, and you could just tell it really wasn't his thing. When we gave him the disc, it was clear to us why that was, because the one guy who was really good was another DI type personality or behavior style, whereas the guy that stumbled through it was, was a D combination with a C, which is attention to detail and analytical skills. 
And so it wasn't the only decision-making point, but what we decided in the end is we really needed to bring in a different sort of set of skills, a different viewpoint, a, um, a different behavior set. And so it wasn't the only decision-making point, but we did end up going with the guy that had the DC because we wanted somebody that was going to be different from the rest of the group intentionally to sort of round out that um, skill set and round out the team overall. More recently, in another client, we had a similar situation where I was doing management training and not a single person on the management team had an S-style behavior on the disc. And when we went to hire them the customer service manager, that person actually showed up as, you know, one of the candidates showed up as a high S. And I said, you know, two things to them. This is perfect if this guy works out and you like him in the interview and everything because it will round out the rest of your team. But I also had to caution them to remember going through the interview process that this guy's going to interview differently. He's going to answer questions differently than how the rest of you will. And so those are some of the things you have to keep in mind. You're using assessments, but remember um, sort of in the context of how you're using them, how that may affect their interview and may affect how they work once they come on board as a company. Um, I put a link here um, on our website on the product page. We have just a ton of all the different uh, disk assessments. You can actually purchase them right on um, the website there if you want to take it for yourself. If you are interested in um, having them actually done at your company, feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss uh, training or just if you just want pricing on the actual disk assessments. And then finally, just to share some best practices with you. Um, going back to some of the things that Marla said, uh, first of all, just make sure that any of the tests that you're using, any selection procedures, anything you're doing during the recruiting process is without regard to any protected ca characteristics. The last thing you want is someone to come back and just allege that you know they got weeded out based on age, race, gender, whatever. Um, you want to make sure that everything is job-related and validated for the positions and the purposes for which they're used. So remember, you're looking for validity and reliability with respect to hiring. As I mentioned before, um, you look at my DISC results, what do they say? DISC is not um, a predictive hiring tool, so you cannot say based on a DISC, I'm going to be good or not good at a certain job based on my DISC style. Um, just remember also, one just word of caution, even if the documentation from the vendor of the assessment says it supports validity, you are still responsible. <clears throat> um, you are still responsible under federal law to make sure that the test is valid. Um, so don't just rely on on their information alone. Um, make sure that if you start doing this and you look at, you know, the results and there's any sort of disparate impact, for example, you want to look for alternative tests. Um, that's the next bullet. So a selection procedure test screens out people um, of a protected group on an alternative. Make sure you're updating the test and selection procedures as jobs change. Okay, things change all the time, and that's one of the things I said on an earlier slide is people's traits change, jobs change, and you want to make sure that you are um, keeping up to date and not using, you know, something that worked in the 50s, you know, now. Um, and then also make sure you're not just adopting these casually. This is, you know, such an area um, of federal law where they really take this pretty seriously, and it's really easy again. So uh, one person who filed a claim, and next thing you know, it's a class action suit. You don't. You want to make sure that the tests are effective, appropriate, and that also somebody knows how to administer them and score them. Uh, so don't just leave it to you know somebody out on the shop floor or one of your hiring managers to come up with their own tests or anything like that. You want to make sure that whatever they're doing um, has been approved and that it's being monitored appropriately. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Julie. Um, and oh. hopefully have some questions for us. Yes, we do. Thank you, Linda, very much. Um, but before we get into the Q&A and the expl explanation of how to ask your questions, I just wanted to just clarify real quickly, um, Marla, as far as a legal position on testing, can you kind of share your position too? I know we've got Linda's, but I want to also make sure we have the legal perspective. Well, I'm a very risk adverse um, person individually, and so it tends to come out in my practice as well. I'm not a big fan of testing and assessments pre 
employment. So for the selection purposes of, of, of an applicant or for when we're looking for, uh, you know, lateral moves even. Um, and part of the reason for that is one of the things Linda said, update the tests and select some procedures and, and recognize that jobs change and people change. The problem is employers don't follow the uniform guidelines and that and then that particular that part of it that requires that you maintain all this data and, and that you continue to analyze this data so you can see if it's having a disparate impact. You can see, oh okay, I'm using this test. I've used this test for three years. I've hired 20 people, how many of those people do I still have left and why and how are the others performing and, and looking at that to see if any of it is really, so I'm not a big fan of tests as you can see. That being said, of all the um, different types of tests out there, certainly I'm not familiar with that many of the 700 plus ones <laughs> I refer to, but I am a little familiar with DISC. Um, I've had DISC um, assessments on myself, on people that I work with, and I will tell you that assessment not for purposes of hiring or for even lateral moves, but for purposes of team building and better communication skills is, has been incredible in my use and also in, in use by other um, clients. Uh, just by way of example, understanding why people are good at what they do. When you have someone who comes out of, of that assessment as someone who's very detail-oriented, it's very important and critical to them that they have um, all the details of a job to, so that they can do their job. If you're not that type of person, if you're someone who's more inclined to speak real fast and get in and out of something, so you know I, I need to respect that person's communication and why they need to be communicated in that way, it makes you a better communicator. It makes them a better person, a better employee or, or partner if it's partnership. It, it's just been an incredible tool. So I, I do like it. But for purposes, overall purposes, they're not illegal. I'm just not a big fan because there's always the risk of the, the potential lawsuit. Okay. And Linda, did you want to add anything to that before we go on to questions? Yeah, just one thing. You know, one of the things I should have put on the best practices slide is, you know, if you're thinking about um, using an assessment for the first time, like let's say you go look in that measurement book and you pick one out and you say, oh, this is a great one, you know, start by giving it to the people that you currently have in that role. So let's say you have a group, um, you know, like let's say you run a call center and you want to use some sort of assessment that is going to be a predictive hiring tool for great call center people, give it to your current call center people first without any sort of repercussions. Just ask for them to help so you can do the baseline. And make sure that you feel it's a consistent tool. So if you have people that are great call center people and they're flunking this test, it's probably not a good test to use. If you, you know, if you give it to everybody and everybody in your call center aces it, then maybe it's a better call center tool. So give it to the current employees, give it to the incumbents to see how it tracks with what you already know to be their performance standards, and that will give you some insight also as to whether or not it's probably going to be a good tool for you. Great. And that answered one of our questions already. So speaking of questions, we do want to give you an opportunity to ask both Linda and Marla questions. If you notice on the the uh, actual panel on the right-hand side, typically on your screen, there is a section that says questions. All you need to do is click on the bottom part, type in your question, hit send, and I will read that aloud for either Marla or Linda to answer. Um, we do, going along that same uh, vein of thinking, um, we also have another question here about pre-employment assessments and if they should just be tied by job description. In other words, um, I think what this person is asking is that based on the job description, there's a list of assessment tests that are associated with that type of job or function that they're performing. And um, is that OK to do that? Um, it's, not done universal, it's not done universally, so is that considered legally OK? I'm, well, I'm not they, sure I did. <laughs> I'm sorry, wait. Oh. Linda said she's not sure she understood. I'll answer based on what I thought I understood. OK. Uh, it, you know, first of all, starting with a job description, or Linda doesn't like to use the word job description. She say the essential functions of the job, or the 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 uh, what, what what term do you use, Linda? The success outcomes. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, the whatever you're that. using. I love job descriptions. It's, we, it's a big document that we use in defensive litigation. Whether what no matter what title you give it, but putting forth what what that person's supposed to be doing, essential functions and 
outcomes, conclusions, all of that. And the guidelines, the uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures, actually, that's one of the requirements is that you do have that job, they call it job analysis on what's required of the job. So then it sounded like the next part of that question was, can you tie the assessment or test into each one of those functions? Yes, you can. Um, and does that mean it's okay? No, it doesn't. It, it, if, if it doesn't become validated by the processes required for validation, um, it may result in disparate impact. And if it results in disparate impact, then that test is not going to be okay. Um, is it okay not to give it to everyone? That depends as well. If you're not giving it to all the Hispanics, but you're giving it to all the African Americans, that's not okay. If you're not giving it to all the men, but you're giving it to all the women, that's not okay. So I would discourage not giving it to everyone because anytime you don't give it universally to everyone, you raise the question of who did we exclude and is that a protected class? Got it. Having, no, it having said that, having said that, in case this is what the person wanted to know, it would be okay if you gave it only to your call center employees and you didn't do it for your, you know, whatever, you know, purchasing person. Right? You oh, yes, I was assuming it was the same job. Right, exactly. So you don't have to give it to everybody in the whole entire company, but if you're going to give it to one candidate for a particular position, I would recommend giving it to everybody that applies for that position. Okay. Yeah, I, I assumed for that question that we were talking about the same position. Yeah. Not, not well, I think there's just parts. Yeah, I think yeah. You, you guys nailed it. Thank you. Um, and then we have a couple of questions here on disk profiles. Um, do, can disk profiles change over years? Should you redo the testing, you know, every few years, or is it something that once you're this, you're, you know, a high B, a, a high I, or whatever, does that change? And okay, and I'll let you answer that question. Yeah, first. yeah, it absolutely can change. Um, you know, for me personally, you know, I show up more. I mean, I've taken virtually, you know, every disk that's offered multiple times, right, for different reasons. And I would say, you know, I can tell you I have general characteristics. For example, I tend to be high D, I tend to have almost no S, and I have, you know, a lot of I and a little bit of C. And that's just my personal style that seems to, you know, come up time and time again. But an example I use my new training is one time when I went into a company I was replacing a much beloved HR director. They had, they were going to to fire him as soon as they hired me. If I had gone into that company in a typical high D, I'm here to fix everything, you know, and moving at a fast pace, I would have alienated everybody in that company. So I intentionally spent the first six months building relationships with people and letting them come to me and set the pace. Once, you know, I built those relationships and built rapport with people, then I could go back into my high D. But when I took the assessment there for the first time, my IS behavior, which is very people-focused, was really high and my D was really low. That's about the only time that's happened on the, um, the results of my disc. But it does. You do flex, and that's one of the reasons I like it. Um, how you are playing with your kids or grandkids, how you are on a date, how you are playing sports, how you are at work, at church, whatever, you are going to have different behavioral styles for the most part. And that's why I like this is because it, it does flex, and it is specific to um, that environment. It sort of measures how your personality shows up in a specific environment. Okay, good. And go a oh, second part of that question: <clears throat> Should DISC or Myers Briggs be used in mentoring and training programs? In, in other words, if somebody is, you know, basically comes in at an entry level position but aspires to be sales or maybe wants to work in customer service or something along those lines, is it a a tool that should be used or and can legally be used as mentor and training functions? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I think that's one of the, the ways it should be used, actually, is for training and for coaching. And I don't remember saying this. I had it in my notes. But that's definitely how we use DISC a lot is, um, you know, for rounding out the teams, but also to give you some insight into coaching once the person comes on board. So. I have clients that just give it to everybody as soon as they come in as part of their culture. It's not used to make a decision on whether to hire or fire them, but it's used to say, okay, here's this person's, you know, um, you know, primary style, and in this particular role, here's where they might have some challenges with that, and let us coach them in these particular areas. Sort of like going back to the divine inventory where they gave you some questions where the, you know, the person's results weren't 
entirely consistent with what they wanted for that particular position. They're not necessarily saying, hey, I'm not going to hire the person, but I'm going to drill down further on those questions. And that's how we use the just in particular. I personally, I mean, I've taken the Myers-Briggs. I usually use the Curiosity Temperament Sorter because it's a little bit easier. Um, but in all of those instances, I think that's exactly the way to use it is say, okay, we're hiring this person to this position or maybe even, you know, just teams that have been on board for a long time. We want to do some team building and let's talk to them about, you know, where is their style really helping them and where might it be hindering them um, in re with respect to their job, with respect to relationships with other people. What it will not do, any of those assessments, it will not say, okay, you know what, in order to be an accountant, this person has to have a high C, you know, which is the attention to detail and analytical skills. It does not work that way. It's not a predictive hiring tool. So I would just say to you is if that's what you mean by that question, then don't do it. But if you're talking about just coaching in general, where their style might be working, where it might not be working so well, I think it's a, the best tool you can use. Okay. And um, Barb has a question about DISC and specifically um, teamwork. And she understands that you know you can certainly find out profiles, and it's kind of nice. It's like reading your horoscope. But she doesn't understand how you can facilitate teamwork. She's got two departments that aren't working well together. So Linda, maybe you could walk through how you know a DISC might be used or Myers-Briggs might be used in a specific instance when you're trying to get build teamwork between two departments that just can't work together. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, Barb, please call me because this is probably the thing I'm most passionate about in the work I do. Um, so when I go into a company, you know, and I'm working with a team or multiple teams or whatever, we actually design exercises to get a lot of this out on the table. But here's, here's in the shortest version I can give you. Um, this, to me, is about knowing your own personal style and, and how you like to um, have information communicated to you and how you like to communicate to others. It's also about being able to people read and understand other people's needs and then how to close the gap. And that's, that's really the key part. So let's say, um, I can't usually really use Julie as an example because we have almost the same style, but um, I'll make it up. So let's say Julie is somebody that um, you know, really likes a lot of the detail and you know, she's more slow and methodical about her, you know, how she processes information. And here I come in, you know, full speed, like this bullet point it for me, Julie, don't give me details, whatever, we potentially have a conflict, right? And what I see in workplaces, this is like the source of so much conflict where people take it personally. They think someone like me in a high D style, I'm blunt, I'm rude, I'm you know, moving too fast, I'm not paying enough attention to details, blah, blah, where maybe I'm looking at somebody that has, you know, an SD type behavioral style and I'm thinking, wow, this person's too slow, they're ineffective because I can't make a decision. And people tend to personalize those differences as opposed to appreciating them. And really, what we work on in the team building is to understand where everybody is, to start to appreciate those differences so they know, like, if we're working on a project and I need someone to review my work, I know I can go over to, you know, this person is a high C and say, hey, can you help me out? So that's just one example. I mean, I could sit and talk to you for hours because from the time you start the training to the time it's ended, whether it's a day or like I got done doing an 11-week management training program for a client, everybody said the same thing. Like this part was their favorite part of that training because if they started to understand their interpersonal relationships better and how they can work with their, their other teammates in a more effective way. Well, and on that note, I'm going to say just how effective both of you were today on our presentation. <laughs> Talking about pre-assessments, um, pre-employment assessments. I <laughs> can't talk. Pre-employment assessments. There we go. Uh, I'm sorry. That's all the time we have. I know some of you still have questions here that we didn't get a chance to get to. But feel free to contact Linda or Marla. Their contact information was in the first few slides of the presentation. Thank you. Um, so by all means, feel free to contact them, especially I know we had some questions, specific questions about DISC today. Um, again, Linda. Duffy with Ethos Human Capital uh, Solutions. Ugh, why do I always break up that name? Human. <laughs> I'm you got it. it Ethos today. Human Capital Solutions. Jeez, I'm like tongue tied today. And Marla Merrib Robinson with Merrib Robinson Jackson and Clarkson. Thank you, ladies, so much. We do have another webinar coming up, and I will promise to get my tongue untied by them. April 24th, 2014, 11 a.m. 
HR record keeping obligations in California, what to create, retain, and destroy. Um, a good one, and again, we're following this theme where we kind of covered an overall laws in January, um, and now kind of breaking those down into more detailed uh, webinars. Um, we appreciate your time today and look forward to providing you with more useful information in the future. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.